Very good. Yeah, they taste their food way far away. Okay? Ask Mr. Westcott. We had an angler yesterday. They cast their rod out. They let it sit for about 30 minutes. They didn't touch it. They sat there, were focused, patient, quiet. They were rewarded with a bullhead probably twice that size. The way they feed is they're going to taste that night crawler from far away that we cast out today, okay? They're going to taste it from real far away. It's going to take them time to hone in on it. They're going to circle around it like a vulture does until they finally find out where that bait is, where that food is, okay? When they find it, they're going to eat it. So if, you, if you're fishing today and you cast out, I'm going to bite in two minutes, i got to try a new spot, cast out a new spot, you're not going to catch them. You're just not going to, you're not going to catch anything. If you're going to be patient, let your bait sit there, let the fish taste the food, find it, give them time, they're going to be successful. Can't stress it enough. you got to be patient. Just enjoy what's going on. If you're fishing for bullhead or catfish, when's the best time of the day to go? Night. Night. What's that called? What's it called when you're a night feeder? Nocturnal. They're nocturnal, exactly. So again, what I just what I'm just talking about. You know what kind of fish, you know the life history of the fish, their habits, you become a better angler. So if you wanted to catch bullhead, right now is probably not the best time to go. You want to go right at dusk, during the night, okay? Good time to go. They're good eating fish. Um are they do they feed at the top of the water column or the bottom? Bottom. bottom. They're bottom feeders. Very good. So Another thing, if you're going to go bullhead fishing, you're going to use a bobber or no bobber? No bobber. No bobber. That's it. Very good. All right. If you catch one, if we catch one today, in the last couple of classes, we've caught some nice big bullheads. They're out here. Um, real big, actually. They do have spines on their back fin. What's that called? Dorsal fin. Dorsal fin. How about these ones, the ones on the side? Pectoral fins, very good, yep. Pectoral and dorsal fins, they have spines coming off them, okay? They're not poisonous, but they will they don't even sting you, but they will poke you. They'll break skin. Just be careful when you when you pick them up. I like to pick them up right from the belly underneath those pectoral spines, and you can hold them real good. Alright? Nice job on the catfishes. How about this fish right here? Black crappy, my favorite freshwater fish. And there's one reason it's my favorite freshwater fish, because they taste so good. They are white, flaky, delicious meat. In here you can't keep any. We do have them in here, we do catch them in here. But if you guys are out fishing on your own and you catch some nice crappies, you should bring them home and put them in the frying pan. It's probably why they're called panfish, right? Tastes good in the frying pan. What? No, we only have white crappies in the Connecticut River. Only spot in the state of Connecticut. Black crappies are here. Black crappies are a lot of water bodies. They get the big groups of fish. What's that called? School. 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 What's the benefit of fish schooling? What do you think? Um, they keep together, they protect each other? Yeah, exactly. Yep. Protection from predators, okay? So when a big predatory fish sees a school of black crappie, they may be confused and think it's a larger fish than it really is. They think that one big mass is one big fish. Or they may figure it out, go after them, and if all the crappies go in different directions, then the big predator fish isn't going to be able to pick one out as easy as opposed to just concentrating on one. They're going to be confused. Predator avoidance. How about another reason they school together? <coughs> That's good for us. <laughs> but why is it beneficial for the crappies? <coughs> exact opposite. How about they hunt together? So not only do they avoid predators, but they're also, yeah, they're hunting as a pack. They're hunting together. When one finds food, they all find food. If they find another school of fish, they can actually circle that school of fish and attack them. Okay? So the crappies, they are uh, really unique color. If you catch one, you're going to know what it is. It's kind of gold and black, speckled, really silvery, really pretty fish. Um, they're also called paper mouths because their mouths are very fragile. If you pick them up by their mouth, you can almost see through all, all this area of their mouth. Very, very, um, very, very thin skin. A lot of times you can, you know, you can't even set the hook that much. You kind of got to be gentle reeling them in or else you'll pull the lips right off. Okay? So, crappie is very, very good. Also called the, besides the black crappie, 
A calco bass? Another name for him? Okay, how about these two fish? Bluegill. Bluegill, Blue what's this one? Red Russell No? Pumpkin seed sunfish. Yep, so the pumpkin seed, we also have the red breast. There's the red breast, more common in slow moving rivers and streams, a native fish to the state of Connecticut. But in here and in most water bodies, about 99% of places that have fish in the state of Connecticut, you'll see the pumpkin seed and or the bluegill. Pumpkin seed has that red little dot on their gill flap. We've caught a couple pumpkin seeds this year, not too many yet, but any day is going to bust wide open. We're going to be getting them every cast. Okay, this may be the day. Water's got to heat up a little bit more. We're a little bit behind because of the cold winter. They have that red dot on their gill flap. To me, that's like the most prettiest fish there is. Beautiful color. Okay. Um, this is the bluegill. Big bluegill spot in their gill flap. Now, look at this pumpkin seed. So pretty and colorful. Do you think that's a male or a female? Female. Male. 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 This is the male. Why? Because it's to attract females. <laughs> to attract the females. Yeah. So the pumpkin seed and all sunfish, they're nest builders. So if you walk around a lake or a pond, you'll see, you ever see like a little circle made of like little rocks? Yeah, yeah. That's a nest. That's a nest for a pumpkin seed. So the males actually build that nest, they clear out the area with their tails and they pick up little pebbles in their mouth and they deposit them, make this nice little nest, then they sit on the nest, all colorful, and attract females. So if they have a really nice nest and they're really colorful, a female will come and lay the eggs right in the nest, males will fertilize them, females will take off, and the males stay and guard the nest. Okay? So, how about the female? This is a big female bluegill probably, because why? Really big. Okay? The bigger ones, the bigger fish, are female. Like stingrays. So, yeah, tell you, all fish. Most, that fish right there is a female. It's huge. Why is that? That's a salmon. Why is that? The eggs. Yeah, they got a whole hundreds. Remember, I told you, panfish have tons of offspring? They, all fish. The females have to hold the eggs. They got to carry around hundreds of thousands of eggs. So they got they're larger. They got to have a larger body, a larger frame to carry all those eggs. Okay, the males are the colorful ones. Females are the larger ones. If you catch a really big fish, it's a female, right? So a lot of times it's good to release those really large ones and maybe keep the smaller ones because uh, one uh, the female are the ones having all the eggs. You want to keep them in the in the in the water body so those fish could kind of maintain themselves. One male could fertilize a lot of females. Only one female could carry eggs. Yes. Oh, does a um, bluegill carry eggs in its mouth? No, no, no. They carry them in their bellies. Oh. All right. So some fish, most common fish that we have in Connecticut, we got a lot of them out here. This place is known for really big sunfish, monster bluegills, like nine, ten inches. It's a big bluegill. They fight really hard. I like the sunfish because they eat a worm, a piece of corn, a mealworm, a cricket, a piece of bread, a bear hook, a piece of gum on a hook, a piece of hot dog. They'll eat anything. They're not picky. They'll eat on a hot day, on a cold day, on a sunny day, on a cloudy day, rainy day, snowy day. They're going to eat. They're easy to catch. They fight hard and they're pretty. Yes. They could also eat um, a ready-cooked hot dog. They probably could. They'll eat anything. Okay? So they're fun to fish for. A lot of people, that's the first fish they catch. Okay. How about this fish? The white perch. White perch. Very good. To me, that looks just like that. I mean, when I think of what a fish would look like, it looks like a white perch. All right? The only fish up here that can tolerate both fresh and salt water. Okay? So they can actually move from the Connecticut River out to Long Island Sound. We've tagged them in, in the Connecticut River and found them as far as Rhode Island, okay? So they'll swim out in the ocean and swim back in freshwater rivers, just like the salmon does. They can regulate the salinity in their body, okay? Their body takes. Uh, another schooling fish, big giant groups of fish, okay? Very good tasting. We don't have any here. 
Now, a lot, not many lakes and ponds in Tanika have them, but we do have plenty. Most of the time you'll find them in the big river systems. This is a very, very common fish to Connecticut, a native fish. Yep, this is the yellow perch. Easy to identify by the vertical black and gold bars that they have, bright orange fins. We catch a lot of them out here. Um, they're a really schooling fish. Okay, they'll eat just about everything. Very good eating. They taste really good. Good fillets on them. Uh, what else about the yellow perch? Oh, they eat in the summer, in the fall, in the winter, and in the spring, all year round. Tenacious predators, all right? Um, think about this perch, white perch, okay? Same last name, they're not even the same family of fish. These two fish look a lot alike, right? Yes. Yeah. They're in the same family. The white perch is actually in the same family as a saltwater fish called the striped bass. All right. Um, all these, a lot of these panfish, you'll see, they have some kind of defense against predators. Anybody know what that is? What else? No? Anybody? How about the spines on their back? They got those, those spines that they kind of face backwards, so they can't get eaten from behind. They have to be eaten head on. They've just evolved that way. What kind of defense against predators? At least you got to eat me from the front. All right? At least I got to be able to, I got to maybe have a chance of getting away. Got to be a fair fight. Can't, yeah, it's got to be a little, somewhat more of a fair fight. Exactly. So, when a predator eats them, they have to, they have to swallow them for a head first. Because they have those hard spines coming off their back. All right? When, when the predator eats it, and when we catch them today, we'll show you, if you just grab the fish from the head and run your hand down from the head down to the tail, those spines will fold down very nicely, okay? But, try to come from the back up, you're going to get spines. You're going to get hurt. So, be careful when you're holding them, and that's their defense against predators. So that's it for panfish. Everything else we're going to talk about now has rules of how many you keep and at what size. How about these fish? What do you got? Uh, yep, which one's this one? White white little bars on the fins. Okay, how about this one? Broke shot, very good. How about this one? What? What's up? That's the um, brown trout. Brown trout, very good. Our three trout in Connecticut. We have, we have places, part of the Inland Fisheries Division, we have three fish hatcheries where we grow fish, where we grow just trout from eggs to about this size. And we stock them, we put them in trucks, bring them to places, lakes, ponds, river streams in Connecticut with public access, and we put them out there, and so anglers go and catch them. They're probably the most popular fish that we have in Connecticut. A lot of people like to fish from them. They're kind of majestic. They're really cool looking, and they fight good, and they taste good, so people like to catch them. Um, we grow and stock about a million every year from our state hatcheries. A lot of fish, okay? Plenty to go around. Normally, you keep five a day, where when you're out fishing, you can catch five, or you can keep five a day. You catch as many as you like. Which one of these fish, anybody have any idea which is native to Connecticut? Only one trout. What is that? No. No. Brook trout. Okay, the brook trout is native to Connecticut. This, what we're going to be fishing today is an impoundment of the east branch of the Hammonasset River. All right? Before there was a dam there, there was a stream flowing through. There was brook trout, native brook trout here, when Native Americans, the Hammonasset tribe Indians, were roaming these lands, hunting these lands. They were fishing for native brook trout right here, right in, 100 feet away from where we are right now. Pretty neat. No more brook trout right here. In a lot of places in Connecticut that had brook trout, we lost them in the 1800s, in the early 1900s, when um, settlers started deforesting the lands. Clear cutting all Connecticut for farmland. Brook trout are a really good indicator of clean, cold water. So we started cu cutting all the woods down, all the trees down. Streams got hotter, got more runoff into them, and they just eradicated. They couldn't survive in those temperatures. Now that we're getting more trees in Connecticut, okay, we do still have a lot of uh, small streams that have these native brook trout, and we try to protect those populations. Most of the brook trout you're going to catch, though, come from our hatcheries. 
How about this one? Where's that native to? What fish is this? Rainbow trout. Rainbow trout. And Mr. Westcott caught a rainbow trout in his first cast here yesterday. Okay, so you could catch them. We don't stock them here. We stock them up the street, but they make their way down through the east branch of the Hamanessa River, and they, they do come to this pond. Um, where's the native to? Anybody know? No, not Connecticut. No ideas? No. Keep that in mind, though. Keep that answer. New Hampshire? No. No. Wrong side of the United States. United States. California, they're native to, yeah. So, what's the big, there's a big mountain chain in the United States, on, and there's a, there's a thing, ever heard of the Continental Divide? No. If rain drops on the east side of the Continental Divide, that will drain eventually to the Gulf of Mexico or Atlantic Ocean. If it drops on the west side of the Continental Divide, it'll go out to the Pacific Ocean. And there's a rock, that, no, I just kind of gave it away, a mountain chain that this divide is on. Anybody know what it is? What? Close? Rockies? Rocky Mountains? Okay, so this is the Rocky Mountains, right here, and this is Connecticut and Maine, Florida, California, Washington, Oregon, okay? The Rockies go like right down here. Continental Divide is the tippity top. All right? All this water over here, that's where a rainbow trout native to. Nothing on this side of the Rockies. That's not their range. All on this side. It's all the way from British Columbia, Canada, Alaska, down to Mexico. That's where they're native to. People started settling out there and they really enjoyed the rainbow trout fish, so they started shipping them back over on trains and stocking them in Connecticut. And now we still stock them. We don't have any populations that reproduce on their own here. We just don't have the right environmental conditions. But a lot of fish, a lot of rainbow trout, they're easy to grow at our hatcheries. And so they're really pretty looking, so we stock them. People like catch them. How about this fish? Somebody said. Yeah. Europe. The brown trout is native to Europe, not even North America. People started settling in the United States. They missed their brown trout fishing, started bringing them over on ships and uh, stocking them right here in Connecticut waters. And we have, we have populations that reproduce all on their own. Most of the fish you're going to catch are from a hatchery, but we do have wild populations of uh, brown trout. Okay, how about this big predator? Walleye. walleye. What's unique about the walleye? Eye. It's eye. What about its eye? It's white and shiny. Nocturnal. Yeah, so yeah, what other animals um, have a kind of eye like that? Cat? Oh, no? What other ones? Deer. Deer's one. Owls. Owls. What else? Bats. Bats. Bats don't have eyes. <laughs> <laughs> so, what do the deer and the owls and cats have in common? They all nocturnal, yep. So is the walleye. Okay, during the day, deep down parts of the lake where it's nice and dark. At night, when it starts getting dark, just like the catfish, they come up into the shallows and start feeding. Big time predators, big sharp teeth, big spines. Their body shape is just like the yellow perch, isn't it? Same exact body, just a lot bigger. Uh, same family of fish. The thing about the walleye is they are not native to Connecticut. We have about 14 lakes ponds that we stock them in. We stock them at its finger length size, about the size of your finger. Let them grow. Uh, we buy them from Wisconsin, ship them over in huge tank trucks, stock them out. The reason we started stocking them about 25 years ago is A, they're so popular in the Midwest that we figure we give anglers another opportunity to catch new fish species in Connecticut. But number two, as important, if not more important, we had a lot of lakes or ponds that had so many white perch, so many yellow perch, so many sunfish, that they weren't growing past this big. There wasn't enough food for them. There's too many fish, not enough food, so they weren't growing, overpopulated. Well, guess what? Put a walleye in there, big time predator, all of a sudden there's a lot less yellow perch and white perch, and they're all this big. Plenty of food for them, the walleye are growing big, there's less of them, but they're a lot bigger, so it's a more balanced ecosystem. 
You have to have a predator in aquatic ecosystem, in land ecosystems. These predators are really important for keeping the prey species in check. Like I told you, they're going to have lots of offspring. Rabbits are the same way, a lot of small animals, okay? Squirrels, they're going to have tons of offspring because predators got to eat. There's no predators, they're going to become overabundant and there's not going to be enough food for them. And they're eventually going to crash. All right? How about this one? What's up? Shane pickerel, very good. Sharp teeth, fins pushed way back on their body, they're kind of camouflaged, okay? Torpedo shape, the ultimate predator. Their body is just built for killing. Um, they have, they, what they do is they're called a sit and wait predator. They actually sit in the weeds in the aquatic vegetation and wait for a yellow perch to swim by. And then with their, their body is just formed so they're burst swimmers. They're going to take off super fast, grab that prey in their sharp teeth, kill them. Drop them, come back, and eat them head first. Big time predators. So, the one thing is about pickerel, they're not the best. You're going to catch pickerel today when you're reeling it. When you're reeling it to cast out again. They don't, they, all I said about catching fish and waiting just doesn't happen with pickerel. They're sitting wait predator. They're not out actively searching for food like all these other fish are. They're sitting, waiting. And when you're reeling in, they're going to see your bait, and they might just attack it super fast. Okay? Just how they eat. Different than all these other fish. Pretty unique, though. Really good predators. You got a question? Wait, wouldn't it just be like a cheetah, then? Because it just waits? Yeah, kind of. Yep, yeah. A lot, a lot of animals are sitting wait for predators. But most of the time, fish actively search out their food. Okay. How about these two? Yes. Large mouth bass or small mouth bass? Which one's the large mouth? The one on the bottom. Very good. Large mouth bass, small mouth bass, okay? These are the two most popular game fish in the whole United States. Trout are probably the state of Connecticut. So are bass, maybe 50 50, okay? Bass are most popular in the whole United States, along with catfish. Um, we, have, we have large mouths out here, we have pickerels out here. We don't have walleye or smallmouths. A largemouth bass, this is like an ideal place for a largemouth bass. Shallow pond, it gets nice and warm, a lot of aquatic vegetation, a lot of trees and stuff around for them to hide in. Um, it's what we call a eutrophic water body, okay, so nutrient rich, all right? It gets real warm, a lot of snakes around here and ducks and frogs for them to eat and mice. Okay, they have big mouths. You know what I told you about the pickerel feeding? They have those sharp teeth they use to eat? Yes. Large mouth bass has no teeth, but they're big time predators. They're what we call suction feeders. So they actually come up behind the fish, swim in as close as they can, and they just open their mouths. And when they open their mouths, it actually sucks whatever's in front of them right down. And they swallow it whole. All right? Really, really good fighting fish. We've caught some that are like this big here. We've caught them up to like this big here. We had last year when Church Street was here, okay, we had a storm coming through. So we had to fish a little bit earlier than normal. And right before that storm, we could see the storm coming. But right before that storm came in, the bass went on a feeding frenzy. And I think everybody caught a big largemouth that was like two or three pounds. It was incredible. So you never know what's going to happen out here. There's quite a few of them. Yes? Why is there a like that? The large mouth? Well, it's just flared out for the, for the mouth. Okay, so big fish, if you catch one, um, we'll get some pictures. They're really hard fight fish. This fish right here is smallmouth bass. Okay? This isn't probably the best spot for a smallmouth bass. They like deeper water, cooler water, maybe cleaner. Um, they like rocks. A lot of times they like moving water, like Quinnipiac River, Housatonic River, Connecticut River, big rivers. They like those areas. Um, they have their favorite thing to eat is the crayfish. That's why they hang around the rocks a lot. If you want to catch them, a good thing to use would be something that imitates a crayfish. Um, good place to find them, like I said, big rivers, deep reservoirs. Uh, really, really hard fighting fish. 
Really, uh, really cool fish. Any questions on any of these fish? Okay, we're missing one, right? The northern pike. So, look at this. The great northern pike. This is the top of the food chain in the aquatic ecosystem. All right? They will eat everything they get their big teeth around. If you want to fish for northern pike, don't use a night crawler. You got to use this fish, that size. That's what they're eating. Big fish. They're not wasting their energy and their time on a little tiny meal. They want a big meal. They may only eat once every two days. Okay? This fish, it says, 45 inches, 23 pounds. Wow. Seven years old. How do you think us fish scientists know that it's seven years old? They can tell by rings. Rings on what? What is it? Oh, you like the scales? The scales, yeah. Scales have growth rings on it, just like a tree has growth rings. So you can count those rings, okay? They, they, when, the, when the fish grows, so the scales. And you can actually see little spots where it's grown. It's going to grow a lot faster in the summer and a lot slower in the winter. So when you see those really condensed little growth rings, you know, hey, that's, that's winter time, okay? So you can count the number of winters that the fish has gone through. And um, until its age. All right. So very sharp teeth on its jaw, on its on its uh, tongue, all over its mouth, and the roof of its mouth going down its throat. Okay, they're just built for for killing. Really cool fish. What's it look just like? It looks just more another like fish. Pickerel. Chain pickerel, same family of fish. This is just a bigger fish. You think uh, you think a northern pike would eat a pickerel? Yes. yes. Alright, you think a northern pike would eat a uh, walleye? Yeah. yeah. Would, it, would it eat a northern pike? No. Yeah. yeah. It would eat its own offspring. We actually, the fish biologists in Connecticut, we take these large adult northern pike out of the lakes that they're in, and we put them in special marshes where we can control the environment to get them to spawn. They need leave, they need aquatic vegetation to spawn. The females lay their eggs and they adhere to, to grass and vegetation in the water, and the males come and just fertilize the whole area, okay? So after we do this, the marshes that we, that we manage, we actually have to go in there and trap all these adults out, because if we left them in there, they would eat all their young, their own young. There's one thing that fish think about, and that's growing themselves and feeding. They don't have minds like we do. They just want to eat, 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 grow, 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 <laughs> reproduce, that's it. Okay? So pretty neat. Any questions on any of these fish? Yes? Okay, now the big ones are Yeah. Any other questions, guys? No. Alright, so what we are going to do now is get outside for the rest of the day. Before we do anything, hold on.